from Sand Hill Road in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering People First Network. Brought to you by Mayfield. Hello everyone, I'm John Furrier here in Palo Alto for exclusive conversation, CUBE conversation, part of the People First Network with theCUBE and Mayfield Fund. I'm here with John Chambers at his house in Palo Alto. John Chambers is the former CEO and chairman of Cisco Systems, now running J to see JC2 Ventures, great to see you. Thanks for John, spending the time. Pleasure to be together again. I'm here for two reasons. One, I okay. want to have a conversation about people first and technology ways, but mm -hmm. also I want to talk about your new book, which is exciting, called Connecting the Dots. And it's not your standard uh, business book where, you know, hey, rah, rah, you know, it's like a you know, mm -hmm. medium post these days on, on the internet. Mm -hmm. It's a personal stories weaved in with the lessons you've learned mm -hmm. through the interactions that you've had with many people over the years, so it's an exciting book and I'm looking forward to talking about that. Thank you. Again, John Chambers, legend, Cisco in 1991 when you joined the company from Wang before that. 400 employees, one product, 70 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. And when you retired in 2015, not so much retired because you got some good oh, work my next chapter. <laughs> you got your next <laughs> chapter. 180 yeah. acquisitions, 447 billion in revenue. You made 10,000 people millionaires. You created a lot of value probably one of the biggest inflection points in computer history, the evolution of internetworking and tying systems together. Mm -hmm. It was probably one of the biggest waves, someone before we, the wave we're on now. So an amazing journey. Thank now you. you're running JC2 Ventures, investing in game-changing startups. Mm -hmm. So you're not retired. No, I, I was on to my next chapter. I made my decision almost 10 years before I left Cisco, first to make for a very smooth transition because it's my family and out of the 75,000 people, I hired all but 23 of them. And in terms of what I wanted to do next, I really want to both give back, uh, create more jobs, get our startup engine going again in this country, and it's currently broken. And I want to do that on a global basis on places like France and India as well. So I'm on to my next chapter, but the fun part in this chapter is I only do the things that I love. And you got a great team behind you, but also you have a great personal network. Um, and I want to get into that, your mm -hmm. personal story, as well as your social network and in business sure. and the community. But one of the things I want to get up front, because I think this is important for this mm -hmm. conversation, is you've been very strong. I've seen you present many times over the years, going mm -hmm. way back into the 90s. You're eloquent, you're people-oriented, but you have a knack for finding the waves, seeing transitions. Mm -hmm. You've been through many waves. Yes, and I have, good and, bad. The, and <laughs> good and bad. But one of the big yeah. ones. How? do you spot those transitions? How, and what wave are we in now? I mean, talk about the wave that's happening now. It's unprecedented at many levels, but yes. different, but it's still a wave. It is, and I call them market transitions and often combined with either economic changes or business model changes with technology. And part of the reason that I've been fortunate to be able to identify many of them is I listen to customers very carefully. But also, you're often a product of your prior experiences. Having experienced West Virginia, uh, one of the top states in the U.S. in terms of the chemical industry uh, during the 40s and 50s and 60s when I was growing up there, uh, and literally uh, more millionaires in West Virginia than were in the entire Great Britain. Uh, we were on top of the world in the chemical industry and the coal industry, and yet because we missed transitions and we should have seen them coming, the state fall, fell a long ways. And now we're trying to correct that with some of the startup activity we'll talk about later. Uh, as you see this, and then I went to Boston, 128, <laughs> we were talking earlier, Wang Laboratories, the mini computer air, but I was in IBM first out of the central part of the nation. So I watched IBM and mainframes and then I watched them miss on going to the mini computer and then miss in terms of the internet. So I was able to see the transitions that occurred in Boston, Route 128, where we were the Silicon Valley of the world and we knew it. And this unusual area out in California called Silicon Valley, we paid almost no attention to. And we didn't realize we failed to make a transition from the mini computer air uh, to the PC and the internet air. Then I joined Cisco and saw the internet air. So part of it is you're a product of your experiences and know the tremendous pain that occurs because Boston 128 yeah. is nowhere near what it used to be. So there's no entitlement to this new world out of the thousand high tech companies that I was associated with up there, including four or five giants and mini computers, none of them really are in existence today. So it shows you if you don't identify the transitions, number one, you don't have an opportunity to benefit by them, but number two, you sure have an opportunity to get hurt by them. And you know, these ways also create a lot of wealth and value, not just personal wealth, but community mm -hmm. wealth. Yes. And Cisco in particular had 
a good thing going for at the time. You know, TCP IP was a de facto, not even a standard, mm -hmm. it was a de facto standard. At that time, IBM and mm -hmm. these companies like Digital Equipment Corp, which dominated the network protocol. Yes. Even today, people are still trying to take out Cisco competitively, and they can't because they connected the world. Mm -hmm. Now the world's connected with digital. It's connected with mobile. So we're kind of seeing this connected wave yes. globally. How do you think about that? Now that you've seen the movie at the, the plumbing level, Cisco, yes. Yes. you now have been traveling the world, the we're all connected. We are, and I, it's important to understand that I'm completely arm's length with Cisco. Yeah. It's their company yeah. to run now, and I'm excited uh, about their future. Uh, but I'm focused on the next chapter of my life, and while I think about the people at Cisco every day, I'm into the startup world now, so how do I think about it now? I think most of the innovation over the next decade will come from startups. Uh, the majority of the top engineering students, for example, at a Stanford or an MIT or Polytechnique in France, which is the top engineering school I think in Europe, mm -hmm. or at the IITs in India, uh, they are all thinking about going to startups, which means this is where innovation is mm -hmm. going to come from. And as you think about a digital world going from the time you and I, we almost recruited you to Cisco, and then we finally did, uh, there was only a thousand devices connected to the internet when Cisco was founded. Today there are about 20 billion devices connected to the internet. In the future, it's going to be 500 billion in a decade. And so this concept of digitization combined with artificial intelligence, all of a sudden we'll get the right information at the right time to the right person or machine to make the right decision. Sounds complex, and it is. Yeah. And its ability to do that, I think startups are well positioned to play a key role in, especially in innovation. So while the first stage of the internet and before that were all dominated by the very large companies, I think you're going to see this next phase of digitization. You're going to see a, a number of startups really emerge in terms of the innovation leaders. And that's what I'm trying to do with my 16 investments I've made, but also coaching probably another 50 uh, startups around the world on a regular basis. And the impact of outside Silicon Valley globally how do you see that ecosystem developing with the entrepreneurship models that are now globally connected in with these, these con uh, connection points like Silicon Valley? Yeah. And it will, partially in parallel, partially it, it's a new phenomena. Uh, I saw the movie of Boston 128, as I said earlier, and on top of the world, and then there is no entitlement. Uh, the same thing's true of Cisco, I'm uh, sorry, of, of Silicon Valley today. There's no entitlement for the future, and just because we've led up to this point yeah. in time, doesn't mean we will in 10 years. Yeah. So you can't take anything for granted. What you are seeing, since almost all job creation will be from startups and small companies getting bigger, the large companies in total will probably not add any headcount over this next decade because of artificial intelligence and digitization. Uh, and so you're now going to see job growth come from the smaller companies. If these small companies don't get it formed in all 50 states. Yeah. If they don't have a chance to grow uh, their headcount there and the economic benefits of that, then we're going to leave whole states behind. So I think it's very important that we look at the next wave of innovation. I think there's a very good probability that it will be more inclusive, both by mm -hmm. geography, by gender, and all diversity measures. And I'm optimistic about the future, but there are no guarantees yeah. and we'll see how it plays out. Let's talk about your next chapter. I was going to mm -hmm. wait, but I want to jump while we're on the entrepreneurship sure. topic. Uh, JC2 is, um, a global startup, game-changing startup focus that you have. Yes. What's the thesis? What are you looking for? And talk about your mission. Well, our, our mission is very simple. Uh, I had a chance to change the world one time with uh, Cisco, and, and many people, when I said Cisco is going to change the way the world works, lives, learns, and plays by enabling the internet, everybody said, nice marketing, but you're a router company. And yet, I think most people would agree, yeah. probably more than any other company, we had the leadership role in changing the internet and the direction going on. And now, a chance to do it again, because I think the next wave of innovation will come from startups, and it doesn't come easy. They need coaches, they need strategic partners, they need mentors, as much as they need the venture capitalists. So I would think of us as focusing on disruptive startups that get very excited in these new areas of technology, ranging from physical and virtual worlds uh, coming together, to artificial uh, intelligence and automation everywhere, uh, to the major capabilities on cybersecurity across that, to the internet of things. And so we're trying to say, how do we help these companies grow and scale? But if I were just after financial returns, I'd stay right here in the Valley. I can yeah. back channel anybody. The VCs here I trust and they trust me. And it would be a better financial return. But I'm after how do you do this across a number of states already in seven states and how do you do it in France and India as role models. It's got a lot of purpose. It's not just a financial purpose. I mean, entrepreneurs want yeah. to make money too, but I mean, you've, you've made some good money over the years, but this is a mission for you, this is a it is. purpose. It is, but it was you referred to it in your opening comments. When we were at Cisco, I've always believed that the most successful owe an obligation to give back, and we did. 
We won almost every corporate uh, response, social responsibility award there was. We won it from the Democrats and the Republicans, from Condi Rice and George Bush, and from Hillary Clinton and uh, President Obama. Uh, we also, as you said, made 10,000 Cisco employees millionaires just in the first decade. And we tried to give back to society with training programs like network academies and train seven million students. And I think it's very important for the next generation of leaders here in the Valley to be good at giving back. And it's something that I think they were an obligation to do. And I think we're in danger now of not doing it as well as we should. And for my startups, I try to pick young CEOs who understand they want to make a financial return. They want to get great product acceptance, yeah. but they also want to be fair and giving back to society and make it a win-win, if you will. You know, I think that's key. Mission, mission driven companies are attracting the best talent too these days because people are, are more cognizant of that. Yes. I want to get into um, the, your personal story because you mentioned um, giving back. Yes. And in reading the book, Mm -hmm. Your parents have had a big role in your life, and yes, they being have. in West Virginia has had a big role in your life. You mentioned it having a prosperity environment and then not missing that transition. Talk about the story of West Virginia and the role your parents played because they were doctors or they were in the medical field. Yes. The combination of those two things, the culture where you were brought up yes. and your family impacted your career. Talk about well, I'm, a, I'm very proud of being from West Virginia and very proud of the people in West Virginia. And you see it as you travel around the world. All of us who, whether we're in West Virginia or came out of it, care about the state a great deal. The people are just plain good people and uh, they care about treating people with respect. If I were ever run off a road at night in the middle of the night, I'd want to be in West Virginia <laughs> when I go up to knock on that door. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it, it, it carries through. But also the image of our state is one that people tend to identify in terms of a area that you like the people. Now what I'm trying to do in West Virginia and what we just announced this last week was to take the same model we did on uh, doing acquisitions, 180 of them will, and say here's the playbook, the innovation playbook for doing acquisitions better than anyone else, and take the model that we did on country digitization, which we did in Israel and France and India with the very top leaders, with uh, Netanyahu and Shimon Peres in Israel, with Macron in uh, France and with Modi in India, and drove it through, and then do the same thing in terms of how do we take the tremendous prosperity and growth you see in Silicon Valley and make it more uniform across the country, especially as traditional business won't be adding headcount. And while I'd like to tell you the chemical industry will come back to West Virginia and mining industry will come back in terms of job creation, they probably won't. Yeah. A lot of that will be automated in the future. And so it is the ability to get a generation of startups and then do it in a unique way. At the hub of this has to be the university. They have to set the pace. Gordon Gee, the president there, gets this. Uh, he's created a startup mentality across the university. The dean of the business school, Javier Reyes, is going across all of the university in terms of how do you do startups together with business school, with engineering, with computer science, with med school, et cetera. And then how do you attract students who want to really be a part of this? How do you bring in venture capital? Capital. How do you get the governor and the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House on board? How do you get our two national senators, Shelley Moore Capito and also Joe Manchin, a Democrat and Republican, working together on common goals? Yeah. And then how do you say, here's what's possible? Write the press release, be the model for how a country or a state comes from behind and led at one time, mm -hmm. then a slow follower. Now, how do we leapfrog? And before you say it can't be done, that was exactly what people said first about India when I said India will be the yeah. strongest growing economy in the world, and it is today, probably going to grow at yeah. 7 to 10 percent. That means you double the per capita income of everyone in India if done right every 7 to 10 years. Yeah. And France being the innovation engine for Europe, the place to do business, you and I would have said, John, no way, just five years ago. Yeah. Yet it has become the startup uh, engine for Europe. It's interesting, you mentioned playbook, and you know I always see people try to replicate Silicon Valley. I moved out yes. here from the East Coast in 1999, and it's almost magical here. It's hard to replicate, but you can reproduce some things. One of the common yeah. threads though is education. The role of education in the ecosystem yeah. of, of these new environments yes. seems to be a key ingredient. Your thoughts about how education is going to play a role in these ecosystems because yes. education and grit and yeah. entrepreneurial zeal yeah are kind of the magic formula. Well, they are in many ways. It's about leadership, it's about the education foundation, it's about getting the best and brightest into your companies and then having the ability to dream and role models you can learn from. We were talking about Hewlett Packard earlier, a great role model of, of a company that did the original garage startup and Lou Platt, when I came to, was the president of uh, HP when I came out here, 
I called him up and I said, you don't know me, Luke. <laughs> uh, I'm with a company you've probably never heard of, only 400 <laughs> people, but I don't know the valley, could you teach me? And he did, and he met with me every quarter uh, yeah. for three years. And then when I said, what can I do to pay you back? Because by that time, Cisco was on a roll. Yeah. He said, John, do it for the next generation. And so that's what I'm trying to do yeah. in terms of, you've got to have role models that you can learn from and can yeah. help you through this. The education is a huge part. At the core of almost all great startup engine is a really world-class university, not just with really smart students, but also with an entrepreneurial skill and the ability to really uh, create startups. John Hennessy Stanford did an amazing thing over the last 17 years on how to create mm -hmm. that here at Stanford. The best in the world, probably 40% of the companies when yeah. I was with Cisco we bought were direct or indirect outgrowth of Stanford. Draw a parallel. Berkeley just across the way, and this isn't a Stanford Cal issue. <laughs> uh, equities rate students, very good uh, focus on interdisciplinary activities, but I didn't buy a single company out of there. You did not see the startups grow with anywhere near the speed, even though it was four times the number of students. So this goes back to the educational institution, has to have a focus on startups, has to say how they drive it through. This is what MIT did in Boston and then lost mm -hmm. it when yep. 128 lost its, uh, its opportunity. And this is what we're trying to do at West Virginia. Make it up the startup yep. engine where you've got a president, Gordon Gee, who really wants to drive this through. Bring the, the political leaders in the state uh, and bring the, the mountaineers, global mountaineers to bear and then bring financial resources and then do it differently. So to your point, People try to mimic Silicon Valley, but they do it in silos. What made Silicon Valley go was an ecosystem, an education yeah. system, a environment for risk taking, role models that you could steal people from. And unwritten from, rules too. They had these unwritten rules like pay it forward, your experience yes. with Lou Platt. Steve Jobs Giving talks back. about his relationship with uh, David Packard. Yes. And this on and on. This is an important part it because is. I want to just Tech for good is a big, big issue. Last comment on education, how oh, important for this country to know, our K through 12 system is broken. We're non-competitive. Uh, people talk about STEM, that's important, but if I were only educating people on three things, entrepreneurship, uh, how to use technology, and artificial intelligence, I would build that into the curriculum where we lose a lot of our diversity, especially among females, in the third, fourth, fifth grade. So you have to yeah. really, I think, get people excited about this as a much earlier age. If we're going to become an innovation engine again in this country, we are not today. We're not number one in innovation, we're number 11. Can the you skills that for America? It's, I totally agree with you, and I, would, I don't want to rant and waste a lot of time because my rants are all on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> um, uh, education's a problem. It's like linear. It's like a slow linear train wreck, in my opinion. But now you have yeah. the skills gaps. So you mentioned AI. Yeah. So AI and community are two hot trends right now. We'll stay yes. with community for a minute. You okay. mentioned paying it forward. Open source software, there's, there's new forms of operational mm -hmm. scale now. Mm -hmm. Cloud computing, open source software, that all have this ethos of pay it forward mm -hmm. and community. Mm -hmm. And now the community is more important than ever, not just in the tech world, but you're talking about in West Virginia, and now on a global scale. Yeah. How does the tech industry, how can the tech industry, in your opinion, nurture community at local, regional, global scale? This is a tough one, John, and I'd probably answer it more carefully if I were still involved directly with Cisco, but the fun thing is, now I represent myself and, yeah. and a venture In your own opinion, firm. not Cisco, just like, yeah. as a cultural thing. This is, this is a, the Silicon Valley has magic here, yeah. and a community's part of it. Yes, well, it's more basic than that. I think basically, uh, we were known for two decades, not just Cisco, but all of the Valley as tech for good and we gave back to the communities and we played it forward all the time and I use the example of Cisco winning the awards, uh, but so do many of our peers and we'd, we'd go into Palestine and help rebuild mm -hmm. Palestine in terms of creating jobs, et cetera. We went in with the Intels of the world and the Oracles mm -hmm. and the other players and the HP together, even though at times we might compete. I think today it's, it's not a given. I think there is a tug of war mm -hmm. going on here uh, in terms of what is the underlying purpose of the Valley. Is it primarily to have major economic benefits and uh, uh, a little bit of arm's length from the average citizen and from government? Uh, or is it to do well financially, but also do very well in giving back and make it inclusive? Yes. That tug of war is not a given. When you travel throughout the U.S. Uh, today or around the world, there are almost as many people that view tech for bad as they do tech <laughs> for good. So I think it's going to be interesting yeah. to watch how this plays out. And I do think uh, there are almost competing forces here in the Valley about which way should that go and why. 
The good news is I think we'll eventually yeah. get it right. Yeah. The bad news is uh, it's 50-50 right now. Let's talk about the skill gap. A lot of leaders and companies right mm -hmm. now are looking at a workforce that needs to be leveled up and this new jobs yeah. are coming online that haven't been trained for. There's openings that don't have <laughs> skills for because they haven't yes. been taught. Yes. AI is one example, IoT, you mentioned a few of the others. Mm -hmm. How do great leaders proactively and, and reactively too, get the skills gaps closed? What well, strategies can they, what's the playbook there? Well, two separate issues. How do they get it closed in terms of their employees? And then second issue, how do we train dramatically better than we've done before? Let's go to the first one. Uh, in terms of the companies, uh, I think your ability to track the millennials and the young people is based upon your vision of doing more than, quote, just making a profit. Mm -hmm. And you want to be an exciting place to work with a great culture, and part of that culture should be giving back. Having said that, however, the majority of the young people today, and I'm talking about the tops out of, out of the key engineering schools, et cetera, they want to go to startups. And so what you're going to see is how well established companies work with startups in a unique partnership is going to be one of the textbook opportunities for the future. Because most companies, just like they didn't know how to acquire tech companies, and most of all tech acquisitions failed, uh, even do today. Uh, we wrote the textbook on how to do it differently. I think how these companies work with startups and how they create a strategic relationship with a company they know has at least a 50-50 probability of going out of business. Mm -hmm. And how do you create that working mm -hmm. relationship so you can tap into these young innovative ideas in partnerships? And so what you see with the Spark Cognition, 200 people out of Texas, brilliant, brilliant uh, CEO um, here in terms of what he is focused on, partnering with Boeing in a 50-50 joint venture. 50-50 joint venture uh, to do the next FAA architecture for unmanned aircraft in this country. So you're going to see these companies relate to these startups in ways they haven't done before. Partnership and collaboration and acquisitions are still rampant on the horizon, certainly as a success formula. Recently mm -hmm. in the tech industry, we're seeing big acquisitions, Dell, EMC, yeah. IBM bought Red Hat, and there's some software ones out there. One just was going to public, just got bought um, yeah. today, just, just recently by SAP. How do you do the acquisition? You did 180 of them. How do you do them successfully without losing the innovation and losing the people before they vest in and then leave. And this is a key dynamic. How do companies maintain innovation in an era of collaboration, partnerships, and m and I had that discussion this morning at Techonomy with David Kirkpatrick, and David said, how do you do this? And then as I walked out of the room, I had a chance to talk with about 700 other people, and one of them from one of the very largest uh, technology companies said, John, we watched you do this again and again. We assumed when we acquired a company, we'd get them to adjust our culture and it almost never worked. And we lost the people at a tremendously fast pace, especially after their lockup of 18 to 24 months came out. Uh, we did the reverse. What we did was develop a replicatable innovation playbook, and I talk about it in that book, but we did this for almost everything we did at Cisco, and I would originally <laughs> call that uh, bureaucracy, John. I would have said that's what slow companies do. It actually, if done right, allows you to move with tremendous speed and agility. And so we'd outline what did we look for in terms of strategy and vision. We'd, if our cultures weren't the same, we didn't acquire them. And if we couldn't keep the people to generate the next generation product, that was a bad financial decision for us as well. So our attrition rate averaged probably about 5% or her over while I was at Cisco for 20 years. Our voluntary attrition rate of our acquired companies, which normally runs 20% in these companies, mm -hmm. ran about four. So we kept the people, we mm -hmm. got the next generation product out, and we went in with that attitude in terms of your acquiring to be able to keep the people and make them part of your family and culture. And I realize that might sound corny today, but I, I disagree. I yeah. think to attract people, to get them to stay at your company, it is like a family, it is like how do you succeed uh, and occasionally lose together, and how do you build that family attitude. I knew every illness of every employee, mm -hmm. uh, spouse or their children that was life-threatening, and we were there for them in ways that others were not. So you're, you're there when your employees have a crisis, your customer does, and that's how you form trust and relationships. I'd ask a question, what does the word people first mean to you? Well, people first is like customer first. It means your action and everything you do put your customers and your people first. That's what we did at Cisco. Uh, any customer you would talk to, almost every customer I've ever met in my life will do business with us again uh, or with me again because your currency in today's world is trust, track record, and relationships. And we build that very deep. Same thing with the employees. I still get many, many notes from people we helped 10 or 15 years ago. Here's the picture of my child that you all helped make a difference in, Cisco yeah. and John, and you were there for us when we needed you most. And then in customers, 
it surprised you when you help them through a crisis. They remember that more than when you helped them be successful, and they're there for you. Talk about failure and successes. This is you talk about this in yeah. the book. This is part of entrepreneurship. You can't yeah, succeed is. without failures. Absolutely, handling failures is just as important as handling successes. Your thoughts and and how people should think about that from a mindset standpoint. Well, you know what's fun is for those of you who are parents or will be parents <laughs> in the future, uh, you, you when your child scores a goal in soccer or makes a good grade on a test, you're proud for them. But that isn't what worries you. What worries you is when they have their inevitable setbacks, and everybody has that in life. How do you learn to deal with them? How do you understand how much was self-inflicted, how much of it was, was done by other causes, and how they navigate through that to determine who they are. Part back to the West Virginia roots, I'm dyslexic, which means that I read backwards. Some people in early grade school thought I might not even graduate from college, high school, much less go to college. My parents were doctors, they got it, but how I yeah. handled that was key. And while I write in the book about our successes, I spend as much time on when disaster strikes, how you handle that determines who you are in the future. Jack Welch told me in the 90s, he said, John, you have a very good company, and I said, Jack, you're clearly teaching me something here. We're about to become the most valuable company in the world. Uh, we've won all the leadership awards and everything else. What does it take to have a great company? He said, a near-death experience. And at the time, I didn't understand it. At the end of 2001, after the dot-com bubble, he called me up and he said, you now have a great company. I said, Jack, it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. Uh, our, our, our stock price is down dramatically. People are questioning, can I even run the company now? Uh, many of the people who were so positive turned very tough. And How negative. did you handle that? How did you personally handle that? Well, it's part of leadership. Um, it's easy to be a leader when everything goes well. It's how you handle when things are tough. And leadership is lonely. You're by yourself. No matter how many friends you have around you, it's about leadership. And so you lead it through it. So 2001 took a real hard look. Uh, we, we made the mistake of focusing me uh, on the numbers. And my numbers in the first week of December were going at 70% year over year. We'd never had anything negative to speak of, much less below even 30% growth. And by the middle of January, we were minus 30%. Yeah. And so you have to be realistic. How much was self-inflicted? How much the market? I felt the majority of it was market inflected. I said at that time, it's a 100-year flood. Mm -hmm. I said to the employees, here's how we're going to go forward. We need to bring our headcount back in line to a new reality. And we did it in 51 days. And then you paint the picture from the very beginning, what you look like as you recover in the yeah. future. And while your employees want to stay here, your customers stay with you, your shareholders. Wiped out most of our competitors. Yeah. Uh, Jack Welch said, John, this is probably your best yeah. leadership year ever. And I said, Jack, you're the only one yeah. that's <laughs> going to say that. He said, probably, and he has and, been. And you got the scar tissue to prove it. Prove and, it. and I love the story. because in but your product are your scars. And do you learn how to deal with them? Yeah, and how you and, and be proud of them. It's what you who you are. I don't know if proud's the right word, but or badge of honor. A badge, red, <laughs> red badge of honor. They're 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 painful. Yeah, just don't do it again <laughs> twice, right? You well, know. Don't make the same mistake yeah. twice. But at the same time, yeah. when I teach all these startups, yeah. I expect you to make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you're not taking enough risk. Yeah. And while people might have might say, John, one of your criticisms, you spread yourself a little bit too thin in the company, too thin at times, and you were yeah. too aggressive. After thinking about it. I respectfully disagree. If I had it to do over, I would be even bolder and more aggressive and take more risk. And uh, I would dream bigger dreams. With these startups, that's what I'm teaching them, that's what I'm doing myself. And you know, this is such a big point because the risk is key. Managing risk is actually, you want to be as risky as possible, just don't cut an artery, don't, you know, be do the right things. But in your book, you mentioned yeah. this about uh, your, how you identify web uh, transitions, but also you make a reference to your parents again. And this mm -hmm. is, I think, important to, to bring up because, you know, we have an expression in our company, let's put the patient on the table and let's look at the, let's look at the problem. Yeah. Solving the problems and not going out of business at that time, like your competitors did, yeah. you had to look at this holistically. In the book you mentioned that the experience your parents taught yeah. you, being from West Virginia, yeah. that it changed how you do problem solving. Could you yes, share that with that context? Well, both parents were doctors, and the good news is you got a lot of help. The bad news <laughs> is you didn't get a lot of sympathy because they could fix you. But uh, they always taught me to focus on the real underlying issue, to your point, what is the real issue, not what the symptom is, the temperature, or something yeah. else. And then you want to determine how much of that was self-inflicted and how much of it was market, and if your strategy is working before, continue. If your strategy was starting to get in the tooth, how do you change it? And then you've got to have the courage to reinvent yourself again and again. And so they taught me how to deal with that. I start off the book by talking about how I almost drowned at six years of age. And, and as I got pulled down through the rapids, I can still see my dad in my mind today running down the side of the river yelling, hold on to the fishing pole. <laughs> 
it was an ugly fishing pole, might have cost five dollars. Yeah. But he was concerned about the fishing pole, so therefore, obviously, I couldn't be drowning. So I focused both hands on the fishing <laughs> pole, and as I poked my head above water, I could still see him running down. He got way down river, swam out, pulled me in, set me on the side, and taught me about how you deal when you find yourself with major setbacks. How do you not panic? How do you not try to swim against the tide or the current? How you be realistic to the situation you're in, work your way over the side. And then you know what he did? Put me right back in the rapids and let me do it myself yeah. and taught me how to deal with it. Dad taught me the business picture and how you deal with challenges. Mom, uh, who was internal medicine, psychiatry, yeah. uh, taught me the emotional, the IQ uh, side of the house in terms of how you connect with people. And I believe in this whole one old chapter, I build relationships for life. And, yeah. and I really mean it. I think your currency is trust, relationships, and track record. And then having that holistic picture to pull back and understand what to focus on. And this is a challenge for entrepreneurs, and you're now dealing with a lot of entrepreneurs and coaching them. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they get caught in the forest and miss the trees, right? Or have board meetings or have worry about the wrong metrics or, hey, I got to get financing. How should an entrepreneur or even a business leader, yeah. let's say with an entrepreneur first, then business yeah. leader, handle their advisors, their investors? How do they manage that? How do they tap into that? Because a lot of people, oh, they're not really adding much value. I just need the money. This is important because mm -hmm. this could save them. This could be the pole for them. It could, or it could be also the pole that causes the tent to <laughs> collapse. So I think the first thing when you advise young entrepreneurs is realize you're an advisor, not part of management. And uh, I only pick young entrepreneurs who want to be coached. And as I advise them, I say, all I'm asking is you listen to my thoughts and then you make the decision. And I'll support you either way you go once you've listened to the trade-offs. And I think you want to very quickly realize where they are on vision and strategy and where they are on building the right team and canly evolving the team and changing the team, where they are in culture and where they are on their communication skills because communication skills were important to me. They might not have been to Jack Welch, the generation in front of me, but they were extremely important to ours. But today, your communication mismatch on social media can cost your company a billion dollars. If you're not good at listening, if you're not good at communicating with people and painting the picture, you've got a problem. So how do you teach that to the young uh, players? Then most important, regardless of whether you're in a big company, a small company, public or private sector, know what you know and know what you don't. Many people, especially if they're really good in one area, assume that carries over to others and assume they'll be as equally as good as others, that's a huge mistake. It's like an engineer hiring a good sales lead. Very rarely does it happen. They recruit a business development people who appeals to an engineer, not to the customer. <laughs> and so know what you know, know what you don't. For those things you don't know, surround yourself with both people on your leadership team and with your advisors that help you uh, navigate through that. And I had, during uh, my career, uh, through three companies, I always had a number of advisors, both formal and informal, that I went to and still go to today. Some of them were very notable players, like a President Clinton or President Bush, uh, Shimon Perez, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, yeah. or names that were yeah. just really technical leads within companies, or people that really understood PR, like Thomas Freeman out of the New York Times, or things of that type. You always love being in the trenches. I noticed that at Cisco as an observer. I really do. But now that you're at startups, it's even trencher, <laughs> more trenches deeper. Yeah. And you got, you've seen the playing field. So I got to ask you the personal yeah. question. Yeah. How'd you look back at the tech yeah. trends that's happening right now, yes. globally, both political, regulatory, technology? What what advice would you give your 23 year old self if you were breaking into the business? You were either okay. at Wang and you were going to make your move in this in this yeah. world in this world today. What's going on? What would you be doing? Well, the first thing on the tech trends, don't get too short term focused. Pick picture the ones that are longer term, what we refer to in digitization, artificial intelligence, et cetera. Uh, if I were uh, 23 years old, or better yet, 19 years old, <laughs> and we're two years through college, and, and thinking what did I want to do for college, and then on to MBA school, and perhaps beyond that legal degree, if I'd follow the prior path, I would focus on entrepreneurship in really understanding in a lot more detail. I learned it over 40 years in the business. Uh, and I learned it from my dad and my mom, but also from the companies I went into before. I would focus on entrepreneurship. I'd focus how technology enables that entrepreneurship. I would probably focus on what artificial intelligence can do for that, and that's what we're doing at West Virginia, <laughs> back to the point yeah. earlier. And then I would think about security across that. If you want really 
uh, job security and, yeah. and creativity for the future. If you're a really good entrepreneur with artificial yeah. intelligence capability and security capability, you're going to be a very desired resource. So if we saw you, obviously networking is a big part of it. You got to be yeah. networking with other people yeah. in the industry. Yeah. Would you be hosting meetups? Young John Chambers right now, be tech meetups. Would you be um, at conferences? Would you be writing code? Would you be doing a startup? Well, if you're talking about <laughs> me advising them, no, if you're 23 being, years old right now. Oh, if yeah. I were 23 right you years right now, I'd be forming. My, I'd be in MBA school and I'd be forming my own company. Uh, and I would be. I listen to customers. Yeah. I think it's important to meet with your peers, but. While I developed strong relationships in the high-tech industry, I spent the majority of time with my customers and with our own employees. And so I think if, if at that age, my advice to, to people is there was only one yeah. Steve Jobs. Yeah. He just somehow knew how, what to build and how to build it. And uh, when you think yeah. about where, where they were, it still took him seven years. <laughs> uh, I, I would say really get close to your customer. Don't yeah. get too far away. If there's one golden rule, uh, that a startup ought to think about is learning from and staying close to your customers is there too. understand your differentiation, your strategy. Well, John, thanks so much. And the book, Connecting the Dots, a great read. It's, uh, again, not a business book in the sense of boring. A lot of personal stories, a lot of great lessons. And thanks so much for taking the time. John, it's my pleasure. Thank great you very to see much. you again. I'm it John Furrier here with the People First interview on theCUBE, co-created content with Mayfield. Thanks for watching.